Hello, and welcome to the Patent Literacy Symposium and this session, Syllables or Morphemes, When to Teach Which and Why. My name is Andrew Bell, and I am joined by my colleague, Jenny Alicandri. We are excited to facilitate this session for everyone. Before we start, we have a few housekeeping items to review. You can access the presenter handouts for this session. We'll put them in the chat, actually, and then they'll be loaded onto the platform later. Um, we'll put that link in the chat for you. Just as a reminder, this session will be recorded and is 75 minutes in length, which includes a 15 minute question and answer period. To access closed captioning, click on the icon CC live transcript on the Zoom control panel. If you experience any technological difficulties, please go to the technical support guides above the schedule on the symposium page. Because this is a webinar, microphones have been muted and your video feature has been turned off. We would love for you to tweet out or share out on social media all you are learning from the Literacy Symposium. The hashtag for the symposium is hashtag PatentLit 2022. And now we welcome Devin Kearns. Good morning. Thank you, Andra, for uh, introducing me. and. Hello to everyone here. You can see that the title on the slide is slightly different than the one uh, printed in the program. I changed it just a little bit because I'm not going to explain whether one is better or the other. I'm just going to talk about um, why they're both good to teach. Um, so I'm Devin Kearns. I'm Associate Professor of Special Education at the University of Connecticut. Uh, and I was a teacher for seven years, including two years of literacy specialist and working in a clinic for kids with dyslexia. Um, and I spent a lot of time working with kids on how to read long words and often not really being sure whether or not the way I was doing it was the right way to do it. And so uh, I'm excited to share with you all today some of the things that I've learned from uh, all of my experience I'm going to keep the chat window open as we go, uh, and so if you have questions, I will possibly address them during the session, or we'll address them at the end um, as we go. I'll sort of make a decision as we're going along. If the questions are germane, we might address them as we go. If, if um, they're sort of varied, then I'll address them at the end, and I look forward to hearing all of your thoughts. Um, some of the content from the session is contained in the new Structured Literacy uh, book that some of you may know about, edited by Louise Beer Swirling. Uh, I was fortunate to participate in the writing of that book, and um, I get I get paid nothing for the future sales of the book, and so you're more than welcome to. Uh, I recommend it to you not because I'm getting paid, but because I think that uh, that chapter and some others are really beneficial to uh, to help you understand how to teach those kids. Um, the book is called uh, Structured Literacy Interventions, um, and uh, I'll um, put a link to that in the uh, chat at the end. So it's by Louise Spear Swirling is the, um, is the editor. Um, and I'll just put Spear Swirling. Um, if you type in Louise Spear Swirling Structured Literacy into Amazon, you'll, you'll find it. So uh, there it is. Deep of God. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Jenny, for putting that in the chat. All right, so let's go ahead and get started when we talk about syllables and morphemes. I'm gonna start about talking about why it is hard for kids to learn to read long words. Even if they're good at the shorter ones, they still can get stuck with the long ones. We're gonna talk about why that is. I'm gonna talk about strategies to help kids uh, read these words successfully, both at the uh, syllable level and then again at the morpheme level because strategies in both areas can be supportive to students in learning how to read. So uh, I'm going to start by talking about the polysyllabic words in terms of what makes them difficult. When we think about the way that polysyllabic words work, they have, well, more than one syllable. So if you think about a word like a robot, robot has two syllables. The first one, R-O, says ro. And I've written that using the, uh, that is the International Phonetic Alphabet. And I'm going to use that throughout to represent the sounds and syllables. I usually put them in slashes. Uh, Ms. Harrington, if you click on the link, it, you'll be able to, you should be able to download the file directly. Uh, you don't need to have Dropbox to, to actually access it. If you're having trouble with that, then we'll help you at the end. Um, so with robot, you have row and bot. Um, syllables are technically used to contain one sound. So if you look at the part bot in robot, you have the B sound, which is B, which is the onset. It's the beginning of the cell before the vowel. There's then the peak. The link isn't working, somebody says. Okay, well, we'll get you guys the link uh, 
at the end of the session, so you all can access it. Apologize for that. Um, so the onset is the beginning of the syllable before the vowel. The peak is the vowel itself, the ah sound in bot. And then the coda is, excuse me, the coda is the end of it, the part after it. And those are three parts of the syllable. And so when we talk about polysyllabic words, they're words that have more than one peak, basically. They have to have more than one vowel. Okay. So, um, so that's what a syllable is. And syllables are really helpful and important for us to use because they are the anchors around which words are formed. It's really great, but <laughs> syllables are really tricky. Let me explain express a little bit more about why that is. And many of you who are teachers uh, already know what I'm talking about when you have, kids ask you how to spell long words and you're like, well, I'm not quite sure about that. Let's look at some of the challenges that there are. So if you look at the, um, the single letter vowel, that's where the trouble lies. So let's look at a word here. Let's look at the word, um, sorry, I'm having to move the chat, okay. Uh, so a single letter vowel, when I say single letter vowels, what I mean, I mean uh, one letter that makes one sound. And so the one letter that make one sound are really the tricky thing. So you look here, um, you have a variety of words that all have a single letter vowel in them in the first syllable, the A in razor, the E in meter, the I in viper, and so on. So those are all six single letter vowels, if you include Y, that make one sound. And these are the tricky ones. The issue is about the number of pronunciations that the vowel letters can have. Let's think about the letter I for a second and how many pronunciations that letter I might have when it's on its own in a polysyllabic word. So let's take a look. So one is the I sound like in viper. So that's a pretty easy one. We see that a lot. Another one you probably already thought of is the I in linen that says the I sound. So we have the one I saying the I sound, one I saying the I sound. But then you also probably are familiar with the case where the I says the E sound, like in glorious. There's even more. We could also say we have the I sound when it is um, the sound, uh, the schwa sound, the short, uh, sort of the short U sound. It's a unstressed syllable, a sound inflexible. And then you could even say in rabbit, we have an even shorter kind of syllable. Sometimes people call it a schwe or another kind of unstressed syllable. And technically in raisin, there isn't, a, there isn't a vowel sound at all. It's just an end sound that sort of nasalize. And, uh, and you could argue that doesn't even have a uh, sound to it at all. So the letter I doesn't even have a sound. Now that's being a little bit facetious. So if we take those off the table, there are really at least four pronunciations that there are for the, I, for the letter I. So the question for children is always going to be, how do we know which of these to pick? And that is really challenging to figure out is what are we going to do about these things. Um, and this really happens with every one of these single letter vowels. They have words that follow one sound pattern. So if you look there in the first column, or you have letters and then the long sounds for razor, meter, vital, motor. The U has both music and tulip. And then the Y, depending if you want to say the E sound or the I sound is the long sound, um, it has both of those. Um, it has you know, all the short sounds that they make as well. And then they have sometimes other various uh, sounds that they make that are sort of hard to figure out which of, the, which of them you are supposed to say. So how do we help students navigate the complexity of these single letter vowels? Well, we can teach them some pretty simple strategies that we know are helpful to kids to read these words. So first thing we can do is teach the students about the fact that syllables have vowel letters in them. It's a really interesting thing that it turns out that when people look at words, we automatically break the words into parts using the vowel letters as visual anchors for them. So we actually notice the vowel structure of words when we read them. And we can exploit that information to help readers. We can teach them a principle called Ishalav. That stands for ev uh, every syllable has at least one vowel. So with the idea of Ishalav, the students are looking at a word and they can count the vowels that a word has and use that information to read the words. So if we look at the word fantastic, we can actually take that word and we can use the Ishalav principle and we can break it into three parts, each one anchored by a vowel. We've now checked that every syllable has at least one vowel. So when we think about does that in this word, does fantastic have every syllable has at least one vowel? It absolutely does. So that Ishala principle can help us. We can see where the vowels are. And the same thing for the word reduce. 
We have three vowel letters now. Um, and so the question is whether or not this actually follows Ishalav. We have the E, the U, and the other E. Now, we would say perhaps it doesn't actually work that way because, well, we have three vowel letters, but we can actually put some of them together. We can say that the U and the E actually kind of go together. That's a known pattern that students would learn that a vowel consonant E pattern is a unit. So we can put those together in a syllable. And so you can say that those two go together. And as a result, that, is, that does follow the principle. Every syllable has at least one vowel. So that's great. Now, if we look at the other way, we put it that together that way, then it actually doesn't follow the rule because now we have two letters uh, that are in, or kind of putting them together and saying they are within the same syllable, but they're really not, so it doesn't really follow the principle. We need to break it the other way like that in order for it to follow the principle. Every syllable has at least one vowel. The second part of the puzzle is to divide the syllables between the vowels. So, what this means is that in a word like fantastic, we would break it into parts this way. We would break it between the N and the T and the S and the T. And now we have three syllable parts that we can use then to read the word. So if you look here at the word fantastic, then we can break it into syllables that way. And does that follow the division principle? It absolutely does. One thing that people think about sometimes is that this is the only way to divide it because there's uh, these principles or rules of syllable division that I'll talk about a little bit later. But actually, is a case that's not the only way to do it. You could also do it these two different ways because now it follows the principle that we divide it into syllables between the vowels. And those parts both look fine. Having a that syllable that ends with NT or ST is totally appropriate to do. And so we're still following the principle of every syllable has at least one vowel and we've divided it appropriately. Let's look at the word reduce. Can we do the same thing? Well, if we go back to having reduced the way that we know it's supposed to be and we break it here, then we have re and deuce and those are two parts that we can divide into syllables. So that follows that principle. So the first thing we can do to help students is basically teach them every syllable has at least one vowel and then show them that they can divide the word into syllables using those parts. So that's a really valuable uh, strategy to help students when they're trying to learn to read long words. If we break it there, where we have the R, E, D together, that also follows the principle of uh, every syllable has at least one vowel, and then we divide between those vowels. So that also follows that pattern. Now, now we have red and use or use, and that's a little bit trickier in terms of like, is that what we want it to say? I'm gonna come back to that point in a moment. Uh, this is part of the, the um, the issue that we sometimes have with these long words, even if we think we've got it, it can be a little bit tricky. So I'm going to say more about whether or not we can figure out what does that mean with the red and the re? How do we handle this question of like the pronunciation of that first E? A little bit hard to know exactly what it says. So the key there then is that we can teach students that there's a way to determine what pronunciation the vowels have in those syllables. So what we can do we can teach them about open and closed syllables. This is a concept that is probably familiar to many of you, but not everyone. So I'm going to take some time to explain how open and closed syllables work. Open and closed syllables are based on linguistic principles of how words are actually pronounced. And the idea here is that we have, it's about the way we say the sound and where it occurs in a syllable. An open syllable is when the vowel comes at the end of the syllable. And there's a principle in linguistics that when we have kind of a, a long sound, literally, almost literally the long vowel sounds, but also pronounced for a longer period of time, that those can go at the ends of words or the ends of syllables. So the idea of an open syllable is that the vowel comes at the end and it can it usually says the long sound. So that's what an open syllable is. All it comes at the end and has the long sound. So if we work with the word pilot, in the first syllable, P-I, that is the open syllable, P-I, and the vowel in pilot in the first P-I says the long sound, pi. So there is the vowel pi. Um, I put a macron over the I in red there to illustrate that's the long sound. So that's P-I says pi in pilot. That's an open syllable. And we can find open syllables in words. So if you look at that I in pilot, and if you know it's an open syllable, then you know how to pronounce that first I, and you can say the word pilot more easily. We can do the same thing with, um, with the closed syllable. If we look at the closed syllable, the vowel becomes at the beginning or in the middle of the syllable. So if we look at the word pillow, 
pillow has a PIL at the beginning. And the pillow, the PIL and pillow is a closed syllable. And a closed syllable, the vowel is in the middle of the syllable. Uh, and at the, sorry, the vowel is short because it comes in the middle of the syllable or at the beginning of the syllable. And so in the case of pillow, the I is in the middle of the syllable and it says the short sound. So there is pillow saying the short sound. And I put that little smiley face thing above the I. That's a, that's a brev that's designed to show that the short vowel. Um, it's also represented with this little mini capital I you see there in pill. Um, is another way to indicate that's a short vowel sound. So that is the word pillow. And so now we have an open syllable like PI and pilot and a closed syllable like PIL and pillow. And we can use that information to read words. These are tricky. Even though it is apparent at first, like, okay, sure, it's really easy. We have the PI that says PI, the PIL that says PIL. It can be hard to figure this out. So, for example, I'm going to give you some examples, some complexities that we have to, to look out for. So, in the word razor, we have that first A that's an open syllable. I should say ray. The challenge is that sometimes the A says the ah sound when it's in the final, uh, when it's in the final syllable word. It looks great in the initial syllable, but it doesn't often do that in the end. So banana at the end, you would, should say banane, right? If we had a, the A saying the long A sound at the end of the syllable, but it doesn't do that all the time. And that is one complexity we have to handle. When we think about the I, the letter uh, I being a, an open, uh, an open syllable. Um, I often says the E sound in polysyllabic words. So in the word like million, the I says the E sound. That happens a lot. So that can make it tricky for us to know which of those to use. If we look at the letter uh, U, one thing that's tricky about the letter U, even in an open syllable, is that U can say both U or U. So if you look at the word tulip, the U says U. But if you look at the word uh, where is it? I, have, oh, I don't have an example there. Um, to, well, music. So music and tulip are different. Music has the U in it, and the, the tulip has the U sound only. So it's technically kind of the same sound. They're both sort of long U sounds, but music really has a U in it, and tulip only has an U in it. And so this is one complicated thing about the, uh, the letter U anyway. Something to look out for, though, when we look at these long words, is that those things are uh, tricky and easy to get uh, confused. The last one is about the Y and how you pronounce that. Like, it's not really clear what the quote long sound of Y is. Y can say the I sound, like in Psy, say the E sound, like in happy. Which of those is actually the long vowel sound is totally unclear. If any of you know why that is considered the long sound or the short sound, you have to tell me because I actually don't know. Um, but, uh, but in general, it's tricky to figure out which of those is the right one. So, Open and closed syllables are great and they can help us, but there are cases where it's going to be tricky for students to figure out exactly what they're supposed to say. But there are some things we can do to help them. The big thing we can do is practice the pronunciation of syllables. So I'm going to give you an example of a dialogue that you could use to do this with students. You would say to students, let's practice reading long and short vowel syllables. I'm going to practice being the teacher um, and, and the students. So I'm, as a teacher, I say, the vowels at the end, long sound. L-I says lie. So what I'm doing there is I'm saying the vowels at the end to the students. The I, uh, the long sound, and I'm saying the long sound is the sound you make, and L-I says lie. So I'm telling the students what to do. Then I say your turn, and the student says lie. I just have to point to it and have them say it. Um, the vowel in the middle. So here I'm pointing out to the students the vowels in the middle, and it has the short sound there. So L-I-N says Lynn. So I say vowel in the middle, short sound. L-I-N says Lynn, your turn. And the students say L-I-N says Lynn. Say good job. Vowel at the end, toe. Now again, notice here, it's not the word two, it's the vowel, it's the syllable, not the uh, word. So we're focusing on this. The vowel at the end, toe, as a teacher, I'm saying that. So your turn. And then the students just say toe. And I say here, short vowel in the middle, ROM. And I'm asking students to say ROM. And then I say your turn. And then finally here on the end of this row, I have, um, I have just the word, let's see, I have middle, short, middle, short, lem. What you notice I've done here is I've actually strategically written the teacher talk. I'm going to go back for a second to show you what I've done. What you'll notice is the beginning I had vowel at the end, long sound, L-I says lie. What you'll notice is that as I go forward, I try to shorten that dialogue. So we go from vowel in the middle or vowel at the end, 
long sound, short sound, and then I spell it and say it. Here, I just say in one phrase, long vowel at the end, toe. Providing a reminder of the key idea, but that's all. Same thing here, short vowel in the middle, rom. So I'm providing a reminder of the key idea, but not the whole thing. And then here, I'm reducing it even more to, to make it as short as possible the explanation. Um, so you say middle, short, lem. So I can remind students that it's in the middle of the word, it's the short sound, and it's the S sound. So they say lem. So what you would do to introduce these is to remind students of the pronunciation and why it is making that pronunciation. In this case, it's in the uh, it's in the middle, and so that's why it says the short sound, um, and then saying the syllable. And then you can have students practice reading syllables using this principle. So in this case, we just have students read the syllables. We wouldn't have them repeat the sort of the pattern of like, it says, you know, lie or, you know, short, middle, long, end or whatever. All we really want them to do is read the syllables. So we put some syllables down. I often will put them on index cards or something like that. If I'm working with a small group of students, you put them on the smart board um, or whatever. And, um, and have the students read them. And so you can see here, this would be my, vo, rep, tim, fa, li. Um, le has lots of uses. It's one of the tricky things about, as I said, um, lots of word situations. But in this case, we're focusing on the idea of open and closed syllables. We remind students we're focused on the open and closed syllables. They'll know uh, that we're focusing on pronouncing that as li. So this is, a, I think, a good example of the way that is most helpful to teach students something like open and closed syllables. Certainly, you could do a lot of explanation of, of you know, all the complexities of this, but really what we want to emphasize is the pronunciation and the location of the vowel and how those two things are related. That's what students need to learn, and the best way to get them to learn that is by giving them a lot of practice. What we want to do is be really careful about limiting the amount of meta knowledge we provide students. So this is something that I think is valuable to keep in mind and something that I think is not something we probably talk enough about is meta knowledge. So meta knowledge is information related to information. So it's sort of information about information. In the case of reading, um, for teachers, this is information that you should know as a teacher, but students don't necessarily need to know. Oops, okay, I'm sorry, click the hip back side. Um, so, so for example, let me give an example of what I mean. So one thing, this is a, actually a source of controversy for some people still, and I have a strong feeling about it, and you may disagree, but I'll tell you what it is anyway. Um, so the word trigraph. Now, trigraph is a term that you could use to describe three letters that make a single sound. Um, and so, for example, like IGH, you could call a trigraph because IGH together makes the I sound. So it's technically a trigraph, tri, three, graph uh, letters or forms. Um, and some people think we should teach that term to students. I don't think that's necessary. I think that's too much knowledge. It's too much information for kids to have. Is it, is it a problem for you to teach that to them? No, not necessarily. But a lot of times people will have kids remember like, well, is that a digraph or is that a trigraph? If you ask me, it doesn't really matter whether they know that it's three letters and it's uh, together or two letters together. Do they just need to know that IGH says I? That's the key thing. Um, and so, um, uh, so, so really what's key there with the meta knowledge is we don't want to include too much of that information. We don't want students to get caught up on those kinds of things. Like, is that a digraph or is that a trigraph? Let's not worry about that. Let's just focus on what the students need to know, which is that these three letters make this sound and so on. So the terminology is one thing that uh, I encourage you to be careful of is deciding, do we really need to teach about the terms open and closed or not? And that's a big question for me. So in terms of the terminology, I think to myself, um, well, do we need to know the terms open and closed? Or can we just call them long vowel syllables and short vowel syllables? In my opinion, um, there is no real need to teach open and close as terms. Um, that really refers to something um, that's about the linguistics of it, about sort of it's it has, it has to do with location and stress and a lot of kind of technical things about the way your mouth works. There's no real technical reason that students should know that. So I always 
I've argued that you don't actually need to teach students the names open and closed. They seem kind of interesting. I think you as educators uh, should know the terms open and closed because that's technically what they're called. But I don't think that for students, it's necessary for them to learn that term because they already know about long vowels and short vowels and that's fine. Another example of meta knowledge is something used to explain a strategy. And so, um, so let me show you uh, show you this strategy in just a second. I do want to respond to a couple of com a couple of questions uh, that come up that I think are relevant. Um, one was, do you try to emphasize detached syllables or do pseudo words work just as well? In my experience, so yeah, I'm going to talk about both of those. I'm going to talk about um, whole words in a little bit. Um, for detached so so. The study, there's one main study that was done to show that this is effective teaching kids to read syllables, but the researchers showed that when you taught kids just to practice reading like MOT says ma and MO says mo, that practice doing that in isolation resulted in better student achievement and reading. We're testing that now and um, we haven't finished the study, but so far the students seem to be responding to it well. So their, their data suggesting it and my kind of research experience shows that that's appropriate and uh, helpful. Um, it is the case as uh, uh, Dr. Peoples asked, is like, won't the kids go for two instead of toe for, uh, for, for the TO? And the answer is absolutely they will. And so it's important to emphasize we're talking about syllables rather than talking about words. Um, it's also the case with LE that they, you know, LE usually at the end of the word says ol, right? We'll talk about that in a little bit. Stable final syllable people sometimes talk about. So yeah, so basically, it is totally possible that students will think about the other uh, example. The point is that we'll, call, we'll make clear to them we're focusing on the sound of the syllable and not of the word when we're doing that. So, um, so just to kind of go back for a second. So like if I were teaching, you know, uh, at the beginning of this, because am I probably, you know, I don't think it's going to say me, right? Because, you know, do, um, you know, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, me. Uh, am I, right? So that's not surprising. For them to remember that's my, we just want to remind them it's the syllable. And that's also why sometimes you may need to remind students and say, remember, uh, we're practicing syllables, not words. I at the end says, uh, I at the end, long sound, my. Uh, and so that way students will be able to practice it. There's not a need for a lot of correction there, just a lot of practice for students. Um, and yep, so yeah, Dr. Peoples, I agree. So people always make that mistake, but it's kind of like, yep, you got it. The key is just to uh, teach students to, um, that way we're focusing on the syllables, not on the words. So then I want to talk about a strategy. So one form of net meta knowledge we use is this open and closed terminology, which I think you don't need to use. You could just call them long vowel short vowel syllables, because there are no data showing that you, it's helpful to students to necessarily know that language. Data showing that the strategy is helpful, but not the, the language necessarily is helpful. Another one is the syllable house. I wish I could have you all raise your hands and tell me if you've heard of the syllable house before, because there are a lot of people. No, can you raise your hand on here? I can't see you. Um, raise your hand. Yeah, you can, you can. Raise your hand if you've heard of the syllable house before. I'm just curious to see how many of you have actually heard of the syllable house. All right, so there's like at least 30 or 40 hands. Okay. All right. So let me talk to you about the syllable house. So here's the thing with the syllable house. Um, so the syllable house is a way of familiarizing students with the terminology of open and closed, right? So I already said like the terminology open and closed is not terminology that I think is really necessary. What people have done to help students understand the concept of open and closed is to use the syllable house. And the idea is this, that you have the syllable house and when the door to the house is closed, the vowel says it short down. So it's a closed syllable, the vowel says it short down. Then if you open the syllable, uh, sorry, not open the syllable, you open the door, <laughs> you open the door, then you have the long sound because the vowel can say its name. The door is open and the vowel can say its name. So the idea is sort of like it can say its name because the door is open. It can shout outside, something like that. So the idea is that the vowel can say its name because the door is open. So you can, you know, make a little syllable house, right? So you can have it with, you can make a, people have done this, they'll make a little door and you can flip up, you know, make it out of construction paper and fold over the piece and then you can see the, uh, the you know, the, it's, it's gone and now it's open. And so now you say the, the, um, the long sound. Here's the thing. This is not a really good idea. In fact, it's a really bad, if you ask me, it's a really bad idea. The reason is that is not helpful knowledge for students. So I just want to emphasize, this is 
Um, not a good idea. So much so that I, I did this, it took me a couple of minutes to put together and I did it on purpose. If you remember nothing else, please don't teach the syllable house. I think this will stop spinning in a minute, but I am serious that like the syllable house is, although I'm sure many of you have done it, somebody actually confessed it, which is totally fine. Like we, a lot of us have done these things to help students understand this terminology because we thought it was important. But it turns out that that's really meta knowledge. That's extra information on top of the content students actually need to know. And so we're adding this extra stuff that's not necessarily supporting students in learning how to read words, but is giving them this familiarity with the terminology. So they can tell us if we say, well, geo, what kind of syllable is that? They can be like, oh, that's a, yeah, that's a, that's an open syllable. Um, and you know, they can look at their syllable house and remember that because the door is open and so on. But it's really not necessary for students to know that. So um, there are a lot of other things we should do. I'll say more about those in a little bit, besides just focusing on Ishalov and reading syllables in isolation that I've already talked about. But in addition to that, um, really limiting the meta knowledge is an important thing to do. Um, yep. Yeah, and Rachel, I am going to talk about other syllable types. Um, okay. So before I go on talking about other syllable types, I'm going to talk about um, one other thing you can do is about reading the uh, reading these with the short and the long sounds. So you can actually have students read. Uh, so this is actually dialogue that from a program that we designed for students we're testing. We started testing last summer in a, uh, in a five week long brain camp we did uh, during my colleague Fumiko Haste at UConn and having kids do neuroimaging every five days uh, during reading instruction, part of which is this, where we're gonna have the kids practice uh, saying long and saying the long and short sounds for the vowels so students can get used to them. So, um, so we'll basically show them A-E-I-O-U and we'll have them say the short sounds. So I'll say them and the students will repeat them and then we'll do the same thing with the long vowels and then we can practice saying them with the long and the short sounds. So the students get used to being flexible about when they say an A, when they see an A, they know that can say the A sound or the E sound. I'll add here, sometimes people ask me at this point, and I, it's a good question that I don't have a research-based answer to, like, should we also at that point teach them about the schwa sound specifically? You know, because all the long vowels or all the vowel letters can say the reduced vowel sound, as I mentioned before, like inflexible, the I says uh. Um, and so should we teach the kids about that? We do talk to the kids about the fact that sometimes the vowels say something slightly different, but um, whether or not we talk about um, it being like the schwa sound at this point, I don't do it in this activity. We do talk about the schwa sound at other times, but when we do this activity, I haven't actually taught students like specifically that the vowel says um, the like a third sound that it makes is the schwa sound. Um, but I think there's no reason not to do it. It's just not something that I've done. So I don't have a research-based um, rationale for not focusing on the schwa sound, the reduced vowel sound, but, um, but I don't, we have it typically in this activity and, and other people's work, they haven't done that either. So, um, so that is, so, that, so that's about the open and the close and practicing those pronunciations for what we might call long and short vowel syllables. Then there are other syllable types. So let me talk about that. Now, so we have the open syllable like the pilot um, and pillow. So the PI and PI and the PI and pillow. Um, we know that those are long vowel syllables and short vowel syllables. I'm going to give you now information about this. So um, this is what people call the syllable types. I'm going to talk about whether or not I think we need to say anything about syllable types in a minute. But this, these are the things that people talk about, right? So there are six categories of syllable that people talk about. So the third one is the vowel consonant E syllable, VCE syllable, silent E syllable, something like that, like the PILE and pile, compile, that is a vowel consonant E syllable, um, people would say, or VCE syllable or silent E syllable, something like that. Um, there are different terms people we use for that. Um, then the other one people will talk about is an R controlled syllable or vowel R syllable. And then we'll have an actually partner, both of them do that. And then the Consonant LE syllable, or sometimes called a stable final syllable, which is where you have a vowel, a letter, a consonant letter, and then the letters L and E, which pretty consistently say O at the end of a word. And the final, final, the final of these, the sixth category is the a vowel team syllable, where you have multiple vowel letters that make one sound. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the vowel team syllable, which is that sometimes people call this a digraph syllable or a vowel digraph syllable. Um, now, this gets into that terminology thing I was talking about before. So digraph is technically two letters, right? Um, and so uh, so you can have other things or digraphs that 
don't exactly fit this category um, in terms of being a syllable. So like, for example, the letters S and H, um, both, you know, are, that's a digraph too, but it's a consonant digraph rather than a vowel digraph. So that's why sometimes people call it a vowel digraph syllable. Um, the only other problem there is that you can have like IGH, which is technically a trigraph. So then you get a tricky bit of like, well, do we call it a digraph, even though it's really a trigraph? Or if we do something else, and what I do is I do something else, which is I just call it a vowel team. Um, the idea of a team that is, you know, baby, I call it baby meta knowledge, like, you know, it's a little bit of extra information, but it gives the students the idea that the vowel letters go together to make one sound. Um, and, but it doesn't have to be just two letters, it could be three. Um, and the idea that it's a vowel makes that clear. Um, the other part of this uh, in terms of the vowel team is sometimes people separate, uh, they'll separate digraphs from diphthongs or, or diphthongs. You can say it both ways, but the technically correct way to say it was with an F sound, diphthongs, it's a Greek word. So the PH says the F sound. Um, so you could say there's the di, di, the di graph, di graph um, is two letters that make one sound and technically you call it a di graph syllable, even though it could be consonants, but because it's a vowel pair that makes one sound. I don't know what you do about the IGH in that case, but because this is not what I do, but this is what the people who focus on the digraphs um, will say. And then the diphthong is a different category. So diphthongs are um, phonemes in English that are made by putting, moving our mouth during the pronunciation. I'm not going to make you look at my mouth too much, but um, so if you say like ow, for example, you can see ow, you have two mouth movements, oi, those are the two, ow and oi are the two most common uh, diphthongs in English. Interestingly, a lot of the long vowels are diphthongs also, u, a, i, so a lot of the diphthongs are, uh, long vowels are diphthongs also, um, and so it's kind of kind of tricky to call them diphthong syllables, since the diphthong is about the movement of the mouth. It's not necessarily about the spelling. Um, and so I think you can avoid all of that difficulty with vowel team, with you know diphthongs and digraphs. Just calling them vowel teams. It can be two letters. It can be three letters. It just needs to make a vowel sound, and that's enough. So people will teach kids these six categories of syllable types. These are the, these are the most common way ways to divide them into into categories. I am not certain you even need to teach kids this. I've already given you an alternative to doing this. You can teach students that, for example, first that they have to break it into each law, break it into parts, right? And then you can practice saying parts so students get used to saying them. And you can say long, you know, vowel syllables and short vowel syllables. And then you can say these other words or word, non words that have these patterns in them, like, N-E-R says ner, like in partner, you know. Um, A-P says app, and you can practice all kinds of words and nonsense words as syllables for students to practice these things. You can have them practice, you know, consonant L-E patterns. We actually do that. So sometimes you saw in the other section, I had L-E as like a syllable, but we also have like B-L-E on a card and, you know, have like a line, at, you know, like a kind of a marker at the end to say it's the end of the word. So students knew that's, that's like saying bull, B-L-E is bull. So, um, so there's a good reason to teach students to practice these. Do they need to know that there are six categories of them? Do they need to name those categories? There aren't a lot of data on that. So it's not clear that we need to define them or delineate them. We do need students to know vowel consonant patterns. We do need students to know vowel R patterns and so on. Do we need to call them syllable? Do we need to, them to students to know that they're called syllable types, that there are six of them and so on? The answer is really unclear. The data don't indicate that there's anything sort of magical about teaching kids about these types of syllables. What is important is teaching them that already we said multiple times that you have the long sound and the short sound for the single letter vowel. So that's the, the kind of the key point about syllable types. Um, but it's there also aren't data saying that they're bad. <laughs> so uh, teaching students that you know put these things in categories might be useful to them. Um, I wouldn't spend a lot of time. I wouldn't recommend spending a lot of time. Uh, you know, having students categorize things, name them. Like one way to think about it is, do I care if a kid can tell me that N-E-R is a, a vowel R syllable? Not really. If they can say that N-E-R says ner, that's what I care about. Um, and, you know, a lot of you will work with kids with, um, uh, you know, with really serious reading difficulty. And one of the problems with some of these things is that kids 
who have reading difficulty have language processing problems. And when you ask students to give complex explanations for things that don't require them, you're asking students, you're putting an additional language burden on them that actually isn't necessary. So what I mean is that if we can make the language simpler for students and use less language and ask them to use less language to explain something, then I think we should always try to do that as long as the result is the same. So less language with the same amount of content, uh, I think can be really powerful uh, for students in this, in, in this situation rather than teaching them this explicitly. Um, there's a question about dyslexia therapists say dyslexic kids need this type of explicit information. Do you find this to be true? There aren't data indicating that there's anything particularly important about teaching these six types of syllables as unique units. All of the, um, there, so there are lots of programs focused on teaching long words that do have evidence of effectiveness. What's common to them is that students learn how to break words apart using some kind of principles about how to break words apart. And then they identify the parts by which I mean they say the parts. So if students can know how to, if students have a way to say the parts without any sort of rule or knowing any types of syllables, then it's fine. At least as far as I'm concerned, it's fine. So there are data indicating that that is, that is necessarily, nece it's necessary for kids with dyslexia or any other variation on reading difficulty. Um, it's really, uh, the reason that I think is so popular with dyslexia therapists and specialists and people who work with kids with uh, severe reading difficulty is it's it's in Orton Gillingham, which is a, a program or approach many of you know um, that is designed for those kids. And but there's nothing about that that's based in sort of um, facts about the way the language ought to be taught or that there's something particularly special about that for kids with dyslexia. It was a set of principles that people came up with in the early days of trying to teach kids. Uh, with dyslexia to read, and they came up with some things that are really effective for some students, and kids and adults really like them, uh, and so that kind of stuck, but there aren't a lot of data indicating that uh, some of those things are really necessary. So um, in my experience, it, I've not found it to be true, but also data don't indicate that that's particularly true. So thanks for that question. Um, uh, no, you did not burn it up, miss anything, how to break your word apart, so I'm back, about to get to that, so that's a good transition. Okay. So, um, so, so what we can do then is we're going to, um, we're going to, oh, uh, so Andrew's telling me there's more questions than a Q and A thing. I'll address those at the end. Oh, I see those, okay. Um, so let's see. Okay, uh, so we, in terms of how we read things by, uh, by syllable, we can do it with flexibility. So let me give you an example. So we already have two principles. We have the Ishala principle, and we have the idea that we, uh, so that tells we can break it into parts, right? And then we now know that there are two different ways you can say it. So if we look at the word linen, we can break it into parts in following our Ishala principle. So we know that every syllable has at least one vowel, so we can break it up with like, we'll call it our syllable card. We break it up like this, and the L-I says that's a part. So we already broken it up. The syllable has one vowel, so it meets our Ishala principle. And then we say what that says. That says a lie. Now, we've already learned that when we had the I at the end, it says the I sound. So that would say lie. But that doesn't work, does it? The word is linen, not linen. Well, then what we need to do is we need to take it and we're going to break it a different way. And we'll say lin. And then lin, that's something that goes with N and makes a word, linen. So that is how it works. So you basically, you follow the Ishala principle. You can't break it after the E. You can't have line and then just the end by itself because every syllable has to have at least one vowel. So you have to do it either this way or that way. Uh, and then it has to be, make a word in the end. Now, what's imp important to understand here is linen is actually not a particularly common word. And it's not a word that all students would know. English learners, for example, might not know the word linen. A lot of, a lot of kids who don't live in places that are really human might not know the word linen. Uh, uh, linen. And so um, the result is that uh, we want to make sure we emphasize words that kids are going to be familiar with. We'll come back to a little bit later. Okay. Um, so teaching syllable division. So there are ways you can actually teach students to divide words into syllables kind of formally. So here is an example of how that works. There's a pattern, there's a vowel consonant, consonant vowel pattern in English. And what the way that works is that when you see a vowel followed by two consonants, another vowel, we can actually predict sometimes the pronunciation of that first A. So if you divide the word rabbit like that, the if you divide it like that, you see that R-A-B is an 
a closed syllable, so the A has to say ah, so rabbit, right? And so, um, so here you see that like that will work to teach kids to read the word rabbit. So if you break it according to vowel constant constant vowel pattern, then you the first syllable says rab, and you can figure out the word. So that's the pattern: is you can divide between the syllables between the consonants, and then the first syllable has the short sound. The other version of this is the V C V version, where you divide it after the first vowel. That works well in a word like tiger, where you divide it like that. So the first syllable has the long sound. The problem is that there are a lot of cases where this doesn't work. And um, I actually did some research on this. Um, this is from the study that I did. I'm not spending a lot of time on research today, but I'll just, share, uh, just show you uh, briefly um, that what I did is I looked at the data on how often does the VCCV word uh, rule work in two syllable words. So if I told a student, when you break a word between the consonants, um, the first vowel is sound is short, like the A in rabbit says ah, how often does that work uh, as we would anticipate? And the answer is that it works most of the time. So in this graph, what you see here is that for the letter A, 75% of the time that first vowel, like in rabbit, had the ah sound. The other bars are um, the sort of the middle light gray. The second bar down is the schwa sound. The top one is another sound. In the case of A, it's usually ah, like in water. Um, but in most cases, you can see here the, the dark black part here, those are the pronunciations of that first vowel. And the spall the short sound pretty well with the vowel constant constant vowel pattern. So if you were to tell students, break it between the consonants and you can protect the um, the sound of the first vowel, you can know that first syllable, that first syllable is an open syllable, sorry, closed syllable, and you can pronounce the vowel with a short sound, um, that will work. Problem is that it doesn't work as well for the vowel consonant vowel um, version. So the pattern is that you break it after the first vowel, and that makes the first syllable, oh, oops, excuse me, the first syllable open, and, uh, and the result is that, you know, students should be able to say it correctly, but it doesn't work as well as we would like. It particularly does not work well with the letter E, um, uh, but it also doesn't work great with any of them. So what you can see here is the one that's in blue, that's the one where it follows the pattern. So that's like what it should say is the long sound, right? So in 50% of the words that have two syllables um, that, have long, that have the A followed by a constant and uh, well, also like in uh, major, um, the, it works about 50% of the time. About a third of the time, it has the short sound rather than the long sound, like in dragon, and the rest of the time, it's a schwa sound, like in about, um, and so, and then a couple other cases. And so, uh, like water actually would be another one. Um, and so about half the time, it says the long sound as we would predict it to say. In E, with the letter E, it's actually, most of them are reduced vowel patterns, you can see here. Um, that's like means that E says the schwa sound a lot when it's in the first syllable. And when it's not, it actually says the short sound more than it says the long sound. So it literally doesn't work at all. Um, in the case of E, it actually would be better if we taught the opposite pattern that it was, then we had a VCV, it said the short sound. Um, and the same thing you can see, but but it's more true for I it's and O and for the letter U and the letter Y, they are the long vowel sounds most of the time. Although, it should be clear that there aren't very many of those words. These bars are, uh, the height of them has to do with how many words contain those letters. So you can see in that case, it's not great. And that's just for two syllable words. If you add in more syllables, it's even worse. So um, the data don't suggest that teaching kids this rule break it after the first vowel, and that makes the first vowel say the long sound. The data don't indicate that that itself is uh, teaching that as a pattern that students need to learn is particularly effective. But it's also really popular, and some people really don't like that I have said that, um, I, like I've you know, read on Twitter and so on, that people are not always super happy that I say this about the language, that it's not that, it may not be that helpful to teach vowel, constant vowel. Um, what I'll tell you is these data are not about kids. These are data about words, about how often the words follow these patterns. This is not about how children respond to that or about instruction. It's just about whether or not the pattern, the words help students, uh, whether or not teaching the patterns helps students enough. And the data say, like, if you want to teach them vowel, constant, constant, vowel pattern, break between the 
consonants and you can identify the first syllable, that will work fine. Um, but it doesn't necessarily work for the other one. And I've already given you an alternative, which is to teach Ishoab, just teach students that every syllable has at least one vowel, and then teach them to break it into parts between them. And then they can use their knowledge of the short and long vowels and their pronunciations to, to figure that out. So that would be the alternative. So my key message here um, is actually in an uh, article that my colleagues and I just published in the Reading League Journal. Um, that's a little snippet from it there. Um, it's uh, unfortunately, I can't give you a copy of it. It's on their website. I think you have to subscribe to the journal um, in order to access it. Um, but the, there are in this issue in particular, some other really great articles. And so I'd recommend the Reading League Journal to you. Um, I actually am an associate editor for the journal. I get paid nothing for, for that. Um, but I, I do think it's a it's a nice place to get information about good best practice. And so we talked about um, syllable division and and there. And the answer is that there are um, there are, you know some cautions about doing it, particularly in that the vowel consonant vowel pattern where it says the long sound that one doesn't work particularly well. And so it would be important to think about whether or not that's really that helpful. I will say though that some people really like it, and the reason is that. The idea of giving uh, students like something they can sort of rely on, like I know this works, I can, you know, I believe here's something that I can take with me and I can always use, even if it doesn't work. Sometimes having um, information that you think is true can let, can give you kind of a way to get started. And that's a funny thing to say, but the way I'm what I mean to say is that. Some students find long words really intimidating. And if you can give them enough information to help them get started, maybe it'll build their um, sense of you know, self-efficacy enough that they'll be able to read the words. Whether that's true, I'm not sure. Um, and what I would say is that um, you know, the data don't necessarily show that's effective, but teachers really like it and also students like it. Uh, this is a, when I was writing this article, I found this really interesting quotation. This is from a student who was learning Orton-Gillingham, um, published in the 1980s in the Annals of Dyslexia, which is a journal that was uh, founded by the Orton Dyslexia Society. And I'll read it. Knowing basic phonics is not enough, exclamation point. An efficient, structured, logical, scientific, reliably automatic system for dividing and pronouncing longer words was an essential prerequisite for my academic literacy. So there you go. If you want a reason to teach it, I mean, some students report that they find it really helpful. My thought about that is that that means that for some students, it will be effective. Older students, adults who are learning to read, um, they there's some sort of like the idea of learning a complex rule and, and so on is actually kind of interesting to them. It's kind of an intellectual exercise. So that might be interesting. But if you don't think that if it's not a case like that, then I think it's another example of kind of like almost meta knowledge. Word knowledge is not even meta knowledge. It's not really even necessarily that helpful and uh, so on. And they're better alternative. I already talked to you about the Ishalov and the learning to break words into parts and knowing the pronunciations of the vowels. Um, if you do those things and then you find a way to break the words into parts, that may work just as well and possibly better. So the question I always ask is like, I know that this has worked for some kids. I've taught this to kids and I found that kids like it sometimes and that they can do it and they get to be pretty good at it. Since I taught it, uh, I realized that other ways of doing it that I now know how to do actually work at least as well and often better. And that's why I'm recommending to you all um, to consider not necessarily teaching syllable division, but um, teaching them some of these principles we already talked about. Um, so, okay, so that's, um, so, uh, so uh, Rachel's got a nice long comment there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna go on because I wanna talk about more themes before I go back to all the questions, but I will go back to those at the end. Um, so, uh, so that's, so that's that. So I will just share with you, um, for those of you who are interested in syllable division and learning more about that, there are a number of patterns in addition to the one I said. So there's a vowel, constant, constant vowel, like in rabbit, there's a vowel consonant vowel like in tiger. That's a conventional one. What people often do is they'll teach the vowel consonant vowel pattern that way. They'll say, well, that's an alternative. But I say it is, well, if you know Ishalov and you know how to break it the two different ways, right? Like we did with linen, you don't need to know a rule. You just need to break it both ways. So my argument is like, why learn like there's a formal rule when we could just 
break it into parts, right? There's no need for a rule if it works well enough just to break it into parts without the rule. Um, but that's what people will teach is they'll teach that the first way you try it is vowel, constant, vowel like that. And then the second way you try it is vowel, constant, vowel like that. So it becomes the short vowel, right? So it follows basically what I told you already about long and short uh, vowels and open and closed syllables, but it just makes it easier if you don't have to know that there's a specific rule to it. Another one that people teach is the lion pattern. L-I says uh, lie because the vowels at the end. So when you have two vowels next to each other that don't make a vowel team, or digraph, if we're going to say digraph, about digraph or diphthong, um, then you would break it between the two, and um, then the first vowel, the first vowel says the long sound, right? Um, which is actually works pretty consistently. Um, you can have longer patterns like this, where you have three consonants. You have to break it like in from like instant or something like that, um, and then you have long ones like this, um, and that's really just a joke because there are not many words like that. Offspring is also a compound word, but that's literally like they're all, I think it's like the only one. I think there's like also like bullfrog or something. Uh, not even bullfrog is long enough. Um, but that's like the longest, you know, possible intra vowel division you could have. Offspring does not happen that often. It's just like kind of a bad joke, I guess. But, um, but the other ones are ones that people commonly teach. There are another ones with multiple consonants as well. But um, these are the kind of the patterns that are typically taught to students as ways to break up words into parts. The, the Ishawa principle still works for a lion, right? We have every syllable has at least one vowel. Well, we have the I and the O, they don't go together like the U and E and reduce. And so those would be separate. And so every syllable has at least one vowel and then you break it in two. It still works the same way as the other ones. You don't necessarily need to know syllable division. Um, and Ishawa, by the way, um, is, is something that was designed by um, a researcher, Rolando O'Connor who is, uh, did a program called Bridges that she studied over a number of years and had very large effects for teaching students the Ishwa principle for the core strategy for reading polysyllabic words, which is why I, uh, which is why I, one of the reasons I like it. Um, this is a video of me reading words um, or teaching kids to read words. I'm gonna skip it, not just because um, <laughs> it has some don't, more don'ts than do's in it, but the do's, the don'ts make more sense after I explain them a little bit more after this. And um, you can watch this on my YouTube channel. So if you just search for my name and YouTube, um, there's a video, this video shows up of me teaching polysyllabic words. Um, there are a lot of don'ts and most of them are that I taught kids about open closed syllables and all that stuff. Um, there's some other don'ts as well. Um, what I will say is that uh, some of the words that I taught were things that I would not choose to teach again. I was teaching a group of English learners. And so I used some nonsense words and long, really long, complicated words I don't think were appropriate for the students. People ask me a lot of times, should we teach nonsense words? I think if kids are English learners, I would not recommend teaching them nonsense words because lots of words seem like nonsense words now. And if we're going to give them practice with things, let's practice things that are real words for them rather than uh, nonsense words. But I will, I often say like you have inveterate guessers. If you have kids who just want to guess something right away every time, my feeling is like if they're just going to guess, then, uh, then, then, you know, make them not guess by giving them, uh, giving them nonsense words to practice. And I talked about multi learners. Related to that point about multi learners is to teach reasonably familiar units. So I'm going to show you something that um, I think is an amusing example, at least amusing to me example of why this point is important about teaching familiar units. This here is a, uh, a snippet from an actual page and an actual program I won't name for teaching kids to read uh, long words. And if you look at this list of words, uh, this is a list that makes me think about whether or not the words that are being taught are really appropriate words for kids to be reading. Um, so take a look at this list. So I'm going to point out, for example, like, I wondered, like, would kids know the word candid? Like, is that a familiar word? What about sublet? Like, I mean, I guess if kids lived in New York, maybe so, but it's not true everywhere. Septic, maybe if they lived in a rural community, they would know that more. Um, so sublet and septic, those words are for different kids, maybe. Um, those are on the same list. And then rustic, I don't even know if kids in rural areas would really know the word rustic. Um, hobnob is a word almost nobody uses. And then pipkin, uh, I'm not gonna make you raise your hand if you know what pipkin is. If you do, I'm impressed. That is a pipkin, it is an earthenware pot you put in the fire. I forget, I forget when it's from, it's from a long time ago. Um, you can look it up on Wikipedia. Um, that is not a familiar word. That is not a good word to teach. 
Another example of this is with um, phrases. So this is sent from another program again, which shall remain nameless. Students were like asked to read this phrase and the teacher asked like, what do you think this means, right? And then, um, and then the, the teacher, oh, I, I totally know, I totally know. And it's kids literally thought that it meant removing the sugar from the outside of the gumdrops. Like literally they thought it was gumdrop polishing. I will also tell you, I showed this to my sister last weekend, and my sister also thought that the polish out the gumdrops meant. So um, that is not a super familiar phrase. And those are both contained in an actual program for students to learn to read words. That's not a good way to teach kids to read words. You want to teach them things that they're familiar with. We want to use words and phrases that students have likely heard before. Even if they've not read them before, they should have heard them before. Uncommon words, okay. Rare, yeah, not ideal. No, no, no pipkins and polishing gumdrops, uh, or polishing off the gumdrops. Uh, by the way, polishing off the gumdrops would mean like to eat the last of them, right? Um, if you do use less common words, I just recommend pre-teaching them so you can teach students something like this. Let's say some words we're going to hear during blending. Sometimes you will call um, word reading uh, for linguistic phonics blending. Um, listen, discontinue. What's the word? Discontinue, students say. Yes, discontinue. Companies discontinue on popular products. By syllable, discontinue. Your turn. Discontinue. And we might have students practice those a couple of times until they got them to mastery. What I mean is they just need to be able to say it to math. They need to be able to say it correctly. It's really important for students to be able to say words correctly um, so that they actually know what they're focusing on getting to. They have to be able to figure out what word they're trying to pronounce. If they don't actually know how to say the word they're trying to pronounce, it's not going to be really easy for them to get to that. I'm going to talk more about that link between um, sounds and letters and meaning in uh, the later session today, which is about sort of um, expanding our understanding and thinking about the sim simple view of reading. Um, so those are all strategies for reading polysyllabic words just by syllable. And the last part is I'm going to talk about is reading them by morpheme. Um, and then we'll take questions and have a conversation. Uh, well, take questions. You can't really talk as much, but you can share with me by text or um, message. So morphemes. So morphemes are written and spoken letter combinations that represent concepts. So the, so the RE says re, and that means again, or ER says er, it means someone who, or it can mean a comparative adjective. So those are morphemes, they're meaning parts. We have re that's a prefix, ER that's a suffix, then you have bases or roots that are internal to words, um, or words themselves like basket and ball and basketball. So here's some things that are effective for helping students uh, who are learning to read morphemes, or learning to read long words, Using morphemes. First, you can have them memorize common affixes. People ask me if I have like a affix list. I I put one together before, um, but I don't really have like a favorite one. The one I made, I think, is okay, but not necessarily better than any other ones I've seen out there. So, you know, um, I should probably just make one so people can just have it. But um, maybe after the session, I'll, I'll I'll put one on my Twitter. But I. I, I haven't come up with a like a list just because I, I, I made a list, but I just never published it because there are lots of other ones out there I think are fine. Um, but if you want, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll put one, I'll put one, I'm talking to myself now, I'll put one on Twitter. But I do think that there are plenty of lists of affixes, prefixes, and suffixes out there that are pretty good. What I will do is put mine up there with frequency so you can know which ones are more and less frequent. Um, but what you do is you want to teach students common affixes and to memorize their pronunciation and their spelling so students can read them really quickly and accurately. You can think about them like high frequency words. You learn them like high frequency words. So whenever you see T-I-O-N, you say shun. Whenever you say pre, you see P-R-E, you say pre, and so on. So students know T-I-V, too. Like they instantly do those kinds of things. So memorizing those affixes um, to mastery is really effective. So if you're having you know kids do them individually, put them in an index card, or if you're having, you know, you have some sort of tablet app that they can use and they can read them with and do that, but make sure that they have an opportunity to practice uh, those a lot so they can memorize them. And then you want to teach them the peeling off strategy. So peeling off is a strategy um, that basically um, focuses on breaking words apart based on using known affixes. So once you've memorized them, you can use the memorized information by um, breaking the word into parts. And you can physically cover them early on and then stop that later. Uh, and so let me show you what I mean. And then you'll read the base word, chunk the word with the affixes attached. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, so here's a long word that um, 
student, you wouldn't read to students. This is just for your, to give you something that's a little bit tricky. So here's a long word, and I'm going to use the peeling off strategy to read it. So we break it into parts. So here we look at the first part and the second part. So this is, this is the way the word breaks into parts. These are all affixes, right? Not all of them are common affixes, not ones we teach right away to students, but these are all our affixes. And so you probably know all these affixes, which is why they are obvious to you when you see this word. So what we do with students is we, we actually, we peel off the affixes. So we actually cover each of them with a card at the beginning or with, you know, a sticky note or something, depending if you're gonna do it on, on paper um, and, or something like that. And so you can peel off the first pseudo and then the second pseudo and then the hypo and the para. And you also peel off the affix or affixes too. You're left with the base word and this word is thyroid, of course. And if that's not a familiar name word, then this is where we can go back and use ishalop and we can break it into parts. We use that syllable card. We have the Y, that's a syllable. You know, the Y is a syllable, makes a syllable. That's every syllable, at least one vowel, and the OI together. So thyroid. So now we have thyroid, and then we can put the entire word back together to say pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism. So you can see that's exactly the steps there. So you find the affixes that you know, ones you've already taught. Read the base word, chunk it if you need to, and you know, break it into parts and then put the affix back together. So that is the peeling off strategy. That's a nice compliment um, to the other one, to the um, uh, nice compliment to the uh, first strategies we talked about in terms of um, the syllable piece, right? So we talked about Ishalov with the breaking into parts, and now you can add that to peeling off, add peeling off to that. Next thing to do is teach morphological word families, teach words in groups. Um, word families are commonly used to describe like phonograms, like A, T says at, and so on. Technically, word families are morphemic, um, and so those are good to teach. Um, there's not a master list of morpheme units or word families that, um, that I like, but again, I'll, I'll put one on my, I'll add one, I'll put one up and put it on my Twitter later today so people can have it. But um, if you, there, again, there are lists, you do not need me for this or lists of these online, but teaching words that are related morphologically, meaning have the same morphemes in them is really effective. It also helps with vocabulary. So some of the data on teaching kids about morphemes indicate that teaching kids about morphemes is effective for teaching them new vocabulary words, um, which makes sense. If you know un means not, then you know what un unknown means if you know what known means, right? Um, and so that's what uh, is good about teaching morphological word families. So there are a lot of different words here. And I've, I've listed here some words, like this is a kind of in the background, sort of, um, or a bunch of words that are uh, part of the morphological word family for nature. And I've kind of, you know, bolded here, like ones that I probably wouldn't teach, like preternaturally, which kids wouldn't know, um, and so on. But there are other ones on, most of the other ones on this list I would actually teach to kids. Um, they're all kind of common forms of nature. Uh, natural and so you, good for students to know all of those and in a program that we designed uh, several years ago we actually did this um, we had students read morphological word families like uh, in parts like this like we we had words related to react and sign and explore you put all those together to have students read them so um, that's what the that's the morphological word families were and then we took lots of these and we put them into phrases and have the kids read words and phrases to get them lots of practice using them. Um, this strategy is one I like but is not really research vet vetted so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it but basically we want to give kids practice lots of practice reading words with affixes but we didn't have you know whole books and so on so we create these phrases to give them lots of practice but um, I think it's a good strategy, but it's not as database or anything else I've shared with you. There's some other strategies that I recommend to you. Um, I'm, you have the handout. They're also in a, an article I wrote um, with Victoria Whaley um, and Teaching Exceptional Children. Uh, there's a, I think it's Teaching, reading, teaching Students to Read Long Words with Syllables and Morphemes. It's in uh, an article on dyslexia and teaching exceptional children. So I recommend that to you. This table on the left is taken from that. Um, it has a number of other strategies in there too. Um, the best is one of them. So, um, so that's so that's that. Um, you, you want to do all this teaching using explicit instruction, and then the last thing I was going to say is to use Finder, which I will, can tell you more about the website I created. But I'm going to stop there. I'm going to just go right to the last slide, which is oops, there's a thank you slide. Um, is, is, there's a thank you slide, so I can go back to some of the other slides. But.